The Mandalorian Wars were a series of massacres that masked another war, a war of conversion, culminating in a final atrocity that no Jedi could walk away from, save one. Kreia. The Mandalorian Wars were a 16-year conflict between the Mandalorian warrior culture and the Galactic Republic, commencing in 3976 BBY with the Battle of Altir. This war took place two decades after the Great Sith War and lasted nearly 20 years itself. Historians often debate the exact start and end points of the conflict, noting that the Mandalorians had been raiding Outer Rim territories for over 10 years before clashing with the Republic military in 3965 BBY. Under the leadership of Mandalore the Ultimate, who, along with his Lieutenant Cassus Fett, initiated the Neo-Crusader movement, the Mandalorians expanded their territory along the galaxy's eastern edge. Their campaigns included the near annihilation of the Cathar species, but it wasn't until their attacks on planets near Taris that they garnered the Republic's attention. Following a year of minor skirmishes known as the False War, the Mandalorians breached the Republic's defenses, besieged Taris in 3963 BBY, and invaded through three separate corridors in what came to be known as the Onslaught. The war's momentum shifted when the interventionist Jedi group known as the Revankists, led by the charismatic Revan and his companion Malak, joined the Republic military against the Mandalorians. Revan's tactical prowess led to several key victories reclaiming lost territory, which prompted Supreme Chancellor Tol Kressa to appoint him Supreme Commander in 3962 BBY. Revan's strategies drove the Mandalorians back, culminating in a final confrontation with Mandalore the Ultimate at the Battle of Malachor V in 3960 BBY. During this battle, Revan defeated Mandalore in single combat as the Republic and Mandalorian fleets fought above Malachor V. The activation of the Mass Shadow Generator, a superweapon, resulted in massive devastation to both the planet and the fleets involved. The Mandalorian Wars had significant long-term repercussions. Revan forced the Mandalorians to disarm and hid Mandalore's mask, the symbol of their leadership. Both Revan and Malak succumbed to the dark side of the Force while investigating the Sith influence that had incited Mandalore's aggression. Many soldiers and Jedi who had followed Revan during the Mandalorian Wars later joined him and Malak as they formed a new Sith Empire and launched an invasion of the Republic in the conflict known as the Jedi Civil War. Exar Kun was defeated but the war left both the Republic and our own order severely weakened. For twenty years we struggled to rebuild, trying to erase the scars of the terrible conflict. Dorak the Mandalorian Wars were named after the Mandalorians, a warrior culture that had frequently engaged in conflicts with the Galactic Republic. These wars occurred 20 years after the Great Sith War, which saw the Republic fighting against the forces led by two fallen Jedi, Exar Kun and Ulic Keldroma. Both had succumbed to the dark side and declared themselves Sith. Keldroma gained the Mandalorians' loyalty by defeating their leader, Mandalore the Indomitable, in a duel on the planet Kwa. The Mandalorian forces served Keldroma faithfully during the Sith War, but their attempt to conquer the planet Onderon ended disastrously with the Republic's intervention. Mandalore ordered his crusaders to retreat to the moon de Jun to evade their pursuers in its fierce jungles, but his basilisk war droid was shot down and he was killed by predatory animals. Mandalore's mask, the symbol of Mandalorian leadership, was found by a Tang soldier who succeeded the Indomitable as Mandalore. While most believed this soldier assumed the name Mandalore the Ultimate, some thought that Mandalore the Ultimate had usurped the title from the true Mandalore who had found the mask. Years later, a supposed true Mandalore, also a Tang, claimed that Mandalore the Ultimate had stolen the title and mask from him. Following the Sith War, the Republic and the Jedi Order enjoyed a period of peace and rebuilding known as the Restoration Period. To revitalize the Republic's economy and infrastructure, politicians guaranteed safe passage and trade along the hyperlanes to various corporations in exchange for commercial investment. This enabled the Republic to rebuild its military and economy, providing essential goods to the galaxy, and hyperspace explorers resumed their quest to discover new routes. Despite the boost in commerce and funding that bolstered the Republic Navy, 
some groups sought to manipulate the government for their own gain. In 3966 BBY, the city world of Taris, a significant trade hub in the northern dependencies, was admitted to the Republic after corporations like Losan Industries bribed Republic senators. Under Mandalore the Ultimate's leadership, the Mandalorians continued their nomadic lifestyle, rebuilding their ranks. Less than a decade after the Sith War ended, Mandalore the Ultimate was approached by the Zeltron scientist Antos Wyrick, who had been a student of Mandalore the Indomitable during the Sith War. Wyrick had obtained a genetic sample from Arcanian Jedi Master Arka Jeth, Ulic Keldroma's teacher and believed he could genetically engineer force-sensitive Mandalorians. Mandalore agreed to Wyrick's proposal, and the Zeltron initiated the new generation project on the planet Osadia, aiming to produce force-sensitive children from Arcanian offshoot parents. However, Wyrick's involvement with the Crucible slaving organization led to the project's downfall when the Crucible raided the Osadia school and kidnapped all of Wyrick's students. Despite years of searching, Werrick could not recover his students and eventually rejoined the Mandalorians as Mandalore's chief scientist. He became known as Demogol, derived from the Mandoa term Dema Agol, meaning the flesh carver, as he tortured and experimented on captured Jedi to uncover the source of their powers. Another key figure under Mandalore was Cassus Fett, who served as Mandalore's aide-de-camp and top strategist. The Sith took the remains to give to his master, and in exchange he told Mandalore of a vision his master had of the Mandalorians rising up against the Republic. He told him they would conquer world after world, crushing their enemies until the Republic collapsed in on itself. He promised the Mandalorians a glorious victory, and Mandalore believed him. Revan. In 3978 BBY, Mandalore was approached by a Sith emissary who introduced himself as a representative of a powerful Sith Lord. The emissary sought Mandalore's assistance in locating the tomb of his master's rival, Dramath II, on the planet Rekiad. Upon finding the tomb, the emissary shared a vision from his master, foreseeing the Mandalorians sweeping across the Republic, conquering many worlds and ultimately achieving a glorious victory over the Republic. Unbeknownst to Mandalore, this emissary was a servant of the Sith Emperor from a hidden empire, and Mandalore was being manipulated through the Force. The Sith Emperor intended to use the Mandalorians to test the Republic's defenses. Under the Sith's influence, Mandalore embraced the idea of invading the Republic and began reorganizing and rallying the Mandalorian clans for the upcoming battles. Returning to Mandalorian space, Mandalore the Ultimate implemented several key reforms. He decreed that the Mandalorians would accept non-Tong warriors who proved themselves in battle and adhered to the Mandalorian warrior code. Furthermore, the Mandalorians would no longer simply pillage worlds and move on. Instead, they would hold their conquered territories and establish an industrial society based on the, their own code. Mandalore envisioned a society where warriors ruled and were supported by farmers, artisans, and manufacturers who had embraced the Mandalorian way. Consequently, the ranks of the Mandalorians rapidly swelled with diverse humans and aliens including Mandalorian vassals, such as Mandalian giants and Jekelians. This new system was called the Neo-Crusader movement. With Cassus Fett's assistance, Mandalore the Ultimate led this movement, succeeding the Indomitable's Crusaders. The term Neo-Crusader originally referred to an extremist cult advocating for the re-establishment of Crusader traditions, and Mandalore adapted their views to suit his goals. Although the Neo-Crusader movement was initially slow to gain momentum, it gradually transformed the Mandalorians into a more disciplined and organized fighting force. Cassus Fett spearheaded the movement in Mandalore's name while also serving as a strategist and aide. The Mandalorians began constructing new warships at Breshig and Arda II, using war materials stolen from the shipyards at Furost and Abian during the Sith War. As the Neo-Crusaders expanded their domain, they inducted members from various species including Hrakians, Togruta, Deveronians, Nalroni, Zygerians, Drachmarians, and Elamin. We started by conquering worlds just outside the Republic. We did it quietly so the Republic wouldn't really know what was going on until too late. When we finally did hit the Republic worlds, they had no idea we were coming. Candorous Ordo 
In 3976 BBY Mandalore, the Ultimates forces launched their initial strike with a raid on the industrialized planet Althea III in the Outer Rim territories. Neo-Crusader warships invaded the planet, and the battle extended over five days. The Althiri defenders managed to hold off the Mandalorians until a young warrior named Kanderas Ordo broke the stalemate. Ordo was tasked with feinting against one of the enemy flanks to draw them out of formation, but he saw an opportunity in the enemy ranks and took the initiative, forcing the Althiri to fend off assaults from two sides and exposing their vulnerable command ships. Ordo's army swiftly eradicated the Althiri fleet, which was ten times their size, earning him command over an entire subsect of his clan. Althea III became a productive part of Mandalore's war machine, and three years later Mandalore's troops targeted another world, Cathar, home to the feline Cathar species. The Battle of Cathar was led by Cassus Fett, who directed his forces to herd the defenseless feline population into the ocean and massacre them. Despite protests from a single Mandalorian woman, who was also killed, Fett's men carried out the slaughter. Basilisk war droids swept across the planet, killing the remaining population, with only a few hundred Cathar surviving. Over 90% of their population perished in the massacre. The Republic learned of the event, but chose to suppress the news to prevent riots and panic. They mobilized the Republic Navy to guard De Chun, still home to some defiant Mandalorian clans, and the planet Taris which was along the Mandalorian road trade route connecting Corson and Mandalore. Over the next eight years, the Mandalorians raided several worlds, including Corson and Azure. Their warships expanded into the Tion hegemony and hut space on the galaxy's eastern edge. Beginning with the capture of the Liana system, they moved up the Polemian trade route, taking the Markham and Quermia systems, then heading southeast along the Overick Griplink hyperroute to conquer the Kyleta and Flawn systems. Another campaign from the Liana system saw the Mandalorians take the Jaminera system, move south to the Sai Mirth system, and intrude on Hut space by capturing the Taskid, Denogra, and Dernatine systems. The Huts hired mercenary armies to defend their territories, but the Mandalorians often recruited these mercenaries into their ranks. Some Neo Crusaders suggested using creotine a powder from Verulim as a bioweapon to soften targets, but most Mandalorians were disgusted by the idea. A forward supply post named Unity was established on Kylte to support their planned advance into the Mid-Rim. Commander Roland Dyer served in the early battles in the Outer Rim, but began questioning Mandalore's goals and the reasons for testing the Republic's defenses. When his questions went unanswered, Dyer refused to fight in the next battle. Despite being placed on the front lines, he escaped during the fighting to seek answers on his own, investigating Dr. Demigol's history and speaking with those who knew the scientist before he joined the Mandalorians. Known as Roland the Questioner, he was repeatedly captured and sent back to the front lines only to escape again. By 3,964 BBY, Dyer had been caught and returned to the front lines six times. In 3966 BBY, as Taris's resource worlds of Jebel, Vanquo, Tarnith, and Surja were threatened by the Mandalorians, the Republic established the Jebel Vanquo Tarnith line, a defensive cordon around Taris linking these three planets. Admirals Gemus Veltra and Noma Somos were among the officers tasked with holding this line. Mandalore spends years picking off unaligned Rimworlds, the Senate sits. Mandalore gets too close to one full of Republic business interests, and the Senate throws it Republic membership and a security cordon so long it would take five fleets our size to crew it. I'm sure Mandalore did a little dance when he heard the Republic had pledged to defend Taris. They've called these last few months war. I think you can see it's nothing of the sort. Sol Karath. The Mandalorians advance ground to a halt at the end of 3965 BBY, the Republic's navy around Taris, successfully blocked further Mandalorian attempts to capture additional star systems in the Outer Rim, resulting in the Mandalorians going eight months without securing a victory. Eventually, the Mandalorians managed to make headway along the Mandalorian Road and captured the planet Flashpoint, home to the Flashpoint Stellar Research Station, following a brief skirmish with Republic men. Flashpoint Station was then repurposed as a laboratory for Demogol, where captured Jedi would be brought for his experiments. 
A few months later, the Mandalorians attempted to seize the agrarian world of Surja, which was positioned along the cordon between Tarnith and Jebel. They engaged Republic forces under the command of Captain Saul Carath, but the battle ended inconclusively. Over the next six weeks, three more skirmishes occurred at Surja, but none resulted in a decisive victory. Around this time, a charismatic young Jedi began to advocate for Jedi intervention in the conflict with the Mandalorians. He promoted revanchism, the idea of retaking territories lost to the Mandalorians. His views were met with suspicion and hostility by the increasingly conservative Jedi High Council, wary of the Dark Side's influence. Encouraged by his Jedi Master, Kreia, the young Jedi openly challenged the Council and gathered a following of like-minded Jedi, including his friend, Alec. The movement became known as the Revanchists, and the Republic media dubbed their leader the Jedi's own Crusader. Defying the Council's wishes, the Crusader led Alec and the other Revanchists on a scouting mission to the battlefront, stopping on Taris in hopes of recruiting Jedi stationed there. When they failed to convince any of the five Jedi Masters or their Padawans, they departed for Surja. Shortly after, the Crusader left his followers on Surja to investigate Mandalorian activity on Onderon and Di Sun, leaving the Revanchists unprepared for an ambush by Mandalorians led by Roland Dyer. Alec and the other revanchists were captured and taken to Flashpoint, where Demogol tortured and experimented on them to determine the source of their powers. The situation took a dramatic turn when the galaxy learned of the Padawan Massacre. Four of the five Padawans at the Jedi Tower were murdered by their masters, members of a secret Jedi Covenant dedicated to preventing the Sith's return, and Master Lucian Dre's Padawan Zane Carrick was blamed for the killings. Carrick and the Snivian conman Marn Hieroglyph evaded the Covenant Jedi and Taris's police, and their failure to capture Carrick led to a public loss of faith in the Jedi Order's ability to police themselves. On the same day the Revanchists were captured on Surja, Carrick was captured by bounty hunter Valius Ying and brought to the Jedi Tower. Carrick's capture caused planet-wide celebrations on Taris as companies like Losan Industries had begun to withdraw from the planet following the massacre. However, Carrick's escape from the Jedi Tower with the help of his friends aboard the junk hauler. The last resort incited mass panic and rioting. The overwhelmed police force, led by Constable Noana Sowers, faced additional chaos as her children were kidnapped, leading to the recall of the five Jedi Masters to the Republic capital of Coruscant. The prologue is over, we're breaking out on the Outer Rim and more. The real Mandalorian wars have begun. Roland Dyer Seeing the Jedi's withdrawal as a chance to seize Taris and initiate a full-scale invasion of the Republic, Mandalore the Ultimate ordered his soldiers to attack Vanquo, breaking an eight-month stalemate. During the Battle of Vanquo, Mandalorian forces overwhelmed the Republic Navy and shattered the Jebel Vanquo Tarnith line, conquering the mining world. Simultaneously, Mandalorians breached the Republic Cordon and advanced towards Taris. As 3,963 BBY began, Admiral Veltra withdrew his army closer to Taris, reorganizing the remaining fleets into a new defensive line. Admiral Somos was severely injured and evacuated to Wayland, but Veltra perished when his flagship, the Reliance, was destroyed. Consequently, the Mandalorians laid siege to Taris. Mandalorian dreadnoughts bombarded the planet from orbit, initiating weeks of devastation as they invaded, facing resistance from Taris's modest planetary defense forces, the Taris Home Guard. A Taris resistance formed from the remnants of the police, and swoop gangs like the Hidden Bex joined the fight against the invaders. Despite their advances, the Mandalorians faced unexpected setbacks. The Jedi Council directed the Crusader to rescue the captured Jedi at Flashpoint Station, but Zane Carrick and his allies accomplished the task instead when Carrick's friend Jarrell was captured. To rescue Jarrell and the other Jedi, Carrick's group tricked the Mandalorians into believing the Republic had booby trapped their ships, causing them to flee the station. Demogol was seemingly captured, but unbeknownst to Carrick and his team, the scientists switched armors with Roland Dyer, who had fled the Vanquo battlefront and joined Carrick's group, and placed Dyer in a coma. Alec and the Revanchists took Demogol back to Coruscant while Roland Dyer boarded the last resort. Shortly after, the Crusader reunited with his followers and resumed his campaign for Jedi intervention, 
quickly becoming a celebrity within the Republic. The Republic media portrayed the revanchist leader as a crusading savior wrongfully ignored by the Council, and he became widely known as the revanchist. He traveled the galaxy, spreading his message to all who would listen. One of the revanchist Jedi, a Cathar named Pharaoh, brought to his attention the absence of the Cathar species from their homeworld. The revanchists investigated the planet, excavating and searching for evidence of what had happened to its population. As they besieged Taris, the Mandalorians also launched invasions through corridors running through three adjacent sectors, an offensive known as the Onslaught. They moved west along the Outer Rim, capturing the Zongorlu system before launching offensives against planets in the Republic's Northern Rim. Ord Mantell fell to the Mandalorians, who also attacked Zabrak colonies in the region, and Ithor, where a Republic counterattack supported by Zabrak military units repelled the invaders. The Mandalorians then attacked the Zabrak homeworld of Iridonia, conquering and occupying it for some time and recruiting some natives into their ranks. Republic and Zabrak forces eventually liberated the planet, but a Mandalorian presence persisted within Iridonian society. Another invasion corridor saw the Mandalorians assault Wayland, bombing its surface and destroying colonists and factories. The third invasion corridor was directed towards the core. The Mandalorians captured Jebel, establishing a warforge on the ice planet to supply their offensive and serve as a staging point for a planned attack on the core world of Alderaan. This is a new phase of war. We're going to have changed the way we look at things. Saul Karath, after the Mandalorian nuclear attack on Sirocco. In response to the onslaught, the Galactic Senate mobilized the entire Republic Navy to counter the Mandalorian threat. Around this same time, Mandalorian soldiers struck at Onderon, besieging the walled city of Aziz with basilisk war droids. Onderon and its moon Dijsun fell under extended Mandalorian control, later serving as a strategic staging point. The remnants of the Outer Rim fleets retreated to the core worlds, leading to Captain Carath's promotion to Rear Admiral. A significant battle group, designated Battle Group Sirocco, was assembled at the planet Raltir. Given command of the inexpugnable class tactical command ship Courageous, Karath was tasked with defending Sirocco, the next world in the path of the Mandalorian's advance from Jebel. Karath set up camps near the stone cities of the native Sterab, forming a defensive line around the planet. However, Mandalore the Ultimate saw this tactic as dishonorable as it presumed the Mandalorians would not attack civilian cities. To teach the Republic a lesson, he launched an assault. Zane Carrick was on Sirocco with Marn Hieroglyph, staffing the Quartermaster-class supply carrier Little Bivoli, which served the Republic men on Sirocco. The day before Mandalore's attack, Carrick experienced a forced vision of the impending assault. Determined to warn Carrick, Carrick sneaked aboard Lieutenant Carthonas's ship, the Deadweight, to reach the Courageous. Carath, suspicious of Carrick and believing him to be a Mandalorian spy, refused to believe his warning. Ignoring Carrick's explanations, Carath ordered his arrest, but allowed Onasi to try contacting Alec, known to Carrick only as Squint. However, the Mandalorian fleet arrived at the Sirocco system just minutes after Onasi left the bridge, and Carath ordered his ships to raise their shields as the Mandalorians launched missiles. To Karath's shock, the nuclear warheads bypassed the Republic ships and struck Sirocco's surface, devastating 27 population centers and wiping out most of the Sterab cities. The surprise attack caught most of the Republic army on the ground unprepared, destroying all but eight ships. Jedi across the galaxy felt the simultaneous deaths of thousands through the Force. Fortunately, Onasi had managed to call emergency alerts to 17 Sterab cities allowing their inhabitants to seek shelter in the planet's underground catacombs and survive the nuclear devastation. Revanchist Jedi Mitra Surik, who was on assignment at Sirocco, escaped aboard one of the three military vessels that managed to jump out of the system before the devastation. The Battle of Sirocco made Karath's forces retreat toward the core while under continuous fire from the Mandalorians. The Admiral of the Fleet announced his intention to file an official protest with the Republic over the military's positioning near the Sterab cities. Karath aimed to retreat to Mirka or rendezvous with the tremendous battle group near the Reich Nebula, but ultimately had to fall back to the banking planet Telerath. 
The Courageous was soon boarded by Neo-Crusader shock troopers, driving Carath Onassi and Captain Dallin Morvis to take defensive positions in the ship's brig. They escaped the ship with Carrick's help, who had created an escape route to the deadweight in the hangar. According to Mandalore the Ultimate, the Courageous was melted down by the victorious Mandalorians, and Mandalore claimed his battle axe was forged from the hull of Karath's lost command. Marn Hieroglyph and his Trandoshan companion Slisk narrowly escaped the bombardment when Slisk seized command of a Republic ship, inadvertently saving half a battalion aboard. Upon reaching Chandrilla, the Ministry of Defense approached them to become propaganda figures, Captain Benegriff Goodvaler and his trusty Trandoshan sidekick. Shortly after, Jervo Talion of Losan Industries hired Hieroglyph and Slisk to track down Senator Hadel Garavis on Taris, still under Cassus Fett's occupation. Hieroglyph teamed up with the hidden Bex swoop gang and helped them join with the Taris resistance. Shortly after the bombardment of Sirocco, Lord Arco Adaska of the Adaska Biomechanical Corporation of Arcania coerced scientist Gorman Vandrake into completing his work on weaponizing the enormous space slugs, known as exogorths. Believing that the exogorths, which could destroy entire planets, made him a galactic power, Adaska organized an auction aboard his ship, the Arcanian Legacy, in the Omanoth system. Adaska invited representatives from major factions in the conflict, the Revanchist, Mandalore the Ultimate, and Admiral Karath, to attend his auction. Although the Revanchist could not attend in person, he sent Alec, who was instructed to eliminate the danger posed by the Exegorths after he and several Jedi foresaw the potential impact on the war. Telerath was gripped by panic following the loss of the Courageous at Sirocco, as it was the next planet in the Mandalorian's path. En route to Omanoth, the Mandalorians devastated the planet Nuani and captured Dagari Minor. Mitra Surik and a soldier named Zart participated in the fighting at Dagari Minor. By the time Mandalore reached the Omanoth system, he had used Roland Dyer's apparent death on Flashpoint as propaganda, portraying the Questioner as a martyr to promote the Neo-Crusader cause. Dyer contacted Mandalore on Adaska's behalf, as he was accompanying Vandrake's friend Jarael who was held hostage by Adaska to motivate Vandrake. Upon meeting Mandalore aboard the Arcanian Legacy, Mandalore instructed the Questioner to remain dead for the cause. Karath offered Adaska a seat on the Senate, while Mandalore countered with an offer to make Adascorp the sole weapons manufacturer for the Mandalorians. However, Adaska's ambitions grew, and he declared himself a new galactic power. The auction unraveled due to the efforts of Anasi, Karik, and Lucien Dre, who had been imprisoned by Adaska with Carrick to keep Dre from interfering. Carrick, donning Neo-Crusader armor given by Mandalore to Dyer, staged a fight with Onasi, then he and Dre revealed themselves as Jedi, declaring the affair a trap for Mandalore. Despite Adaska's protests, Mandalore believed them and chaos ensued aboard the Arcanian legacy among the Mandalorians, Adaska's security forces, Republic personnel and Jedi. Amid the turmoil, Carrick assured Vandrake that Jarael was safe, prompting Vandrake to seize control of the Exogorths. He used them to attack the Arcanian legacy, killing Adaska, and then took the Exogorths to wild space to remove their hyperdrive units and eliminate the threat they posed. All of Adaska's guests escaped the doomed Arcanian legacy. Carrick returned to Taris to meet with Hieroglyph, while Karath returned to Coruscant and resigned his commission over the loss of battlegroup Sirocco. However, the Admiral of the Fleet refused to accept his resignation and publicly commended Carath's performance, ultimately giving him command of the newly built, inexpugnable-class tactical command ship Swiftsure. On Taris, the Taris Resistance attempted to bomb the Jedi Tower used by Cassus Fett as a command post, but Fett had already left the Tower and attacked the Resistance in the Lower City. Shortly after the First Battle of Omanoth, known as the Adaska Affair, both the Republic and Mandalorians sought to salvage the remains of the Arcanian legacy, leading to the Second Battle of Omanoth. This skirmish was inconclusive and concurrently, the battle on Mirka, a continuation of the Mandalorian's campaign from Wayland, resulted in the Republic suffering around 2,000 casualties overnight. However, the Republic managed to secure a set of Neo-Crusader assault armor on Mirka and began studying it for weaknesses. 
From Mirka, the Mandalorians moved on to conquer the nearby Thustra system, and then took the Obroa Sky system. Their core ward advance was halted by a series of events on Jebel, where they were preparing to assault Alderaan. Pulsifer, Demigol's former assistant, discovered the Sith artifact known as the Moor Talisman in the undercity of Taris and brought it to Jebel. On the way, the talisman bit one of Pulsifer's subordinates. Jedi Shadow Celeste Morn, along with Carrick and Hieroglyph, stowed away on Pulsifer's ship, and upon discovering the Mandalorian's plans on Jebel, Carrick decided to warn the Republic. Before Carrick could act, the bitten Mandalorian transformed into a Rakul, a fearsome creature that spread the Rakul plague, quickly infecting several other Mandalorians. The plague spread rapidly. Carrick contacted Cassus Fett, who had moved on from the Taris offensive and warned him of the events on Jebel. Pulsifer lost control of the talisman which held the spirit of its original owner, Sith Lord Carnus Muir, when the talisman attempted to take the Force-sensitive Carrick as its host. However, Morn sacrificed herself instead. Under Muir's influence, Morn took control of the Rakuls, the original source of the plague, and quickly infected the entire Mandalorian army on Jebel. Carrick eventually brought Morn to her senses, and she agreed to be locked in an oubliette, or stasis casket, to contain the talisman's power. As Carrick and Herogriff escaped from Jebel, Fett's troops arrived and bombarded the planet with nuclear warheads, wiping out the Rakuls and ending the Mandalorian's planned core world offensive. Around that time, the Republic arranged for Jedi Master Dor Yander Case, who strongly opposed the revanchists' interventionist philosophy to step down from the Council. Disillusioned with the Republic, Case, who had fallen in love with a Mandalorian named Varda before her death in the Sith War, joined the Mandalorians, believing he could change them for the better. Case formed the Mandalorian Knights, a group of like-minded Jedi who fought alongside the Mandalorians. However, Case was succeeded by the similarly anti-interventionist Lucien Dry, who issued arrest warrants for the revanchist Jedi. Shortly afterward, Coruscant was thrown into chaos by Vindication, a pre-planned insurrection among the Jedi Order by the Jedi Covenant. Vindication was ordered by the Covenant's true leader, Hazen, who'd been manipulating the group for his own ends. Hazen seized control of the Republic blockade around Coruscant, using the Vanjavalis chain scheme to link tactical computers. He used the blockade's firepower to bombard Coruscant, eliminating Jedi Order members attempting to seize the Dry Estate just before Vindication. The affair ended with Hazen's death and the Dry Estate's destruction. The incident was covered up as a Mandalorian terror plot, and Carrick's and Hieroglyph's names were cleared of all charges related to the Padawan Massacre. Sometime after the Covenant Affair, the Jedi Council arrived on Cathar en masse to confront the Revanchists, who had defied the Council's order to stand down. Master Vandar Tokari had foreseen a great destruction coming to the galaxy through war. However, the Council misinterpreted the vision, which actually pertained to the impending Jedi Civil War, as a warning against engaging Mandalore the Ultimate in battle. The Council warned the Revanchist and his followers that the Mandalorians were not unique and commanded the movement to disband. The tirade was abruptly interrupted when the Revanchist found a Mandalorian mask underfoot. Upon picking up the mask, all the Jedi present were enveloped in a shared Force vision of the past. They saw Cassus Fett herding the defenseless Cathar into the ocean and massacring them, despite the protests of the woman whose mask the Revanchist had found. Horrified by the genocide, the Revanchist donned the mask and vowed to wear it until the Mandalorians were brought to justice, adopting the simpler name of Revan. In light of this vision, the Jedi Council reluctantly sanctioned the Revanchist's intervention in the Mandalorian Wars, although they publicly denounced Revan's actions as unwise and too hasty. Revan devised a solution that appeased the Council and allowed the Revanchists to join the war. He revived the idea of a Mercy Corps from the Sith War, where Jedi were deputized to serve alongside the Republic military as healers. The Council reluctantly agreed to Revan's proposal, and the Revanchists, now an official Mercy Corps, were placed under Revan's direct command. Revan and Alec, who had by then taken the name Malak, were appointed as generals, working alongside Captain Toletto of the Hammerhead-class Cruiser Testament. In the following months, the Revanchists joined the Republic in battling the Mandalorians openly. 
with Revan proving himself a capable military leader by winning several victories against the Mandalorians. As the year drew to a close, Demogol awoke from his coma and was put on trial for his crimes, although Roland Dyer's claims about his true identity were ignored. Fortunately for Dyer, he was rescued by Carrick and Hierogriff, who had realized that Demogol had switched places with Dyer. To save his friend Jarel from Demogol, Carrick called in a favor from Cassus Fett, earned during the events on Jebel. Carrick arranged for Fett's forces to encounter Admiral Carrath near the Ithor system to lure out Dace Goliard, a member of the Crucible slaving organization. Fett staged an attack on Carrath only to jump to hyperspace, and Goliard, lurking nearby to capture battle survivors, was captured by Carrath, allowing Carrick to learn Jarel's location. I know it offends some of you to have former Jedi in your ranks. Mandalorians win with arms, not tricks and magic. But that's why we joined your movement. My friends believe in a fair fight. Not a corrupt Republic that leans on Jedi for protection. So this time when some Jedi began fighting for the Republic, I didn't just mouth objections like the Council. I set the balance right by giving the Mandalorians their own Jedi. Dorjanda Case, addressing his Mandalorian soldiers on Halthor. At the start of 3962 BBY, Dorjanda Case devised a plan to give the Mandalorians their own Jedi by kidnapping younglings from the Jedi Enclave on Dantween. His scheme received the approval of Mandalore the Ultimate, who permitted Case to train the younglings on the planet Ordo and assigned a detachment of warriors to support him. With Mandalore's backing, Case continued the campaign on the northern edge of the galaxy. After the Mandalorians captured the planet Essien, he lured the Republic into an attack there. Due to a lack of a regular army in that region, the Republic relied on local militias, and the militia from Fader, led by Captain Morvis, was tasked with liberating Essien. The Republic was unaware of Case's betrayal, and Case, along with his Mandalorian knights, led Morvis's men, including Zane Carrick, who had been drafted into the militia, in a charge against the Mandalorian Bastion beneath Mount Savage. After securing the beach at the mountain's base, Case directed Morvis's troops to root out the Mandalorians in the forests. However, Morvis opted to burn the forests with Tibana six shells. Carrick, unable to let the retreating Mandalorians be slaughtered, tried to warn them, only to find it was a trap. A swarm of basilisk war droids descended on Morvis's command, capturing them, led by Case's Mandalorian knights. Despite his men's protests, Morvis's militia was conscripted into the Neo-Crusaders, and Case's Mandalorian knights spearheaded a campaign northward towards Dantooine. One of their first targets was the planet Halthor, where they assaulted a signal station manned by members of the Grand Species. Case blackmailed Carrick into aiding his plans by threatening to devastate his homeworld of Fader unless he complied. Carrick devised a ruse to get Mandalorians aboard the station by staging a fake viral outbreak on Morvis's captured ship, the Frigate Reciprocity, diverting it to Fedacom and enabling the Mandalorians to capture the station. Discovering Case's intended target, Carrick enlisted Morvis's crew to help him steal the Mandalorian Dreadnought Pajai, while Case's knights took the Reciprocity to Dantooine. Carrick tricked Field Marshal Garen Baum and the Pajai's crew into fleeing, by repeating the viral outbreak scam, and then took the commandeered Pajai to Dantooine. The Mandalorian knights quickly seized control of the Enclave and secured the students, but Carrick's attempt to deceive Case into leaving failed. Exposed, Carrick destroyed the ship Case planned to use for extracting the younglings, and Morvis's troops evacuated the younglings to the Reciprocity. Carrick and Case dueled in the Enclave as Case tried to stop the escaping younglings. However, when Case learned the Mandalorians had withdrawn their support for his plans, Carrick convinced the former Jedi Master to surrender. Case and his knights were put on trial, where Case passionately defended his cause for nine hours straight. With the loss of the Mandalorian knights, Mandalore the Ultimate abandoned the northern offensive and withdrew his army from Halthor. After the campaign, Carrick secured a position as a lieutenant and special diplomatic agent attached to Morvis's reciprocity. In this new role, Carrick aimed to serve as the Republic's official conscience, teaching military restraint to save lives and seek a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Meanwhile, across the galaxy, the Mandalorian Wars entered a phase known as the Mandalorian Triumph. 
This campaign began with the Mandalorians conquering the border world of Ares III and setting fire to its Zoxin plains, forcing Mitra Surik's men to retreat. The plains continued to burn for over a decade, making the battle infamous. The Mandalorians then continued their offensive from the Dernatine system, advancing along the Lesser Lantillian route to seize the Charos system. They pushed further along the Great Kashyyyk branch and the Randon run, attempting to capture the strategically valuable Randon system. But the Republic repelled this attempt. From Ares, the Mandalorians raided Azure, then moved on to Contruum, and subsequently headed south along the Vathkri trade corridor to take the Geyser system. They continued their conquests with the Nasri system, followed by the Vena system. After gathering additional soldiers at June, the Mandalorians seized the Ambria system, and then the Zell system. With the Jedi now involved in the war, the Republic unveiled a new fleet of warships constructed in the shipyards of the core and trailing sectors, including Centurion-class battlecruisers and Hammerhead-class cruisers. The Interdictor-class cruiser was also introduced, a concept pioneered by the late Admiral Veltra. Various manufacturing companies tried to capitalize on the war effort by designing and marketing new battle droid models, though these were not as successful as hoped. From the Zell system, the Mandalorians moved corward to Commonor, where they crushed a Republic task force and then conquered the Queller system. They continued their advance by taking the Exodine system and then targeting the shipyard world of Duro. Duro's orbital cities and shipyards were bombarded by basilisk war droids. Around this time, the Mandalorians also attacked the Lantilles system, but the Republic successfully defended it. The Mandalorians devastated Duro's infrastructure, destroying many orbital space platforms to cut off the Corellian trade spine. However, Revan Malak and Mitra Surik managed to prevent the Battle of Duro from becoming a complete disaster. They arrived with a fleet of Interdictor-class cruisers, preventing the Mandalorians from escaping with war material stolen from Duro's shipyards. Bowing to public pressure, Supreme Chancellor Tol Kressa appointed Revan as the Supreme Commander of the Republic military. During the conflict, a fleet of Mandalorian warships also attacked the Tibana mining planet of Bespin. The attackers destroyed most of the mining operations in orbit around Bespin, attempting to disrupt the Republic's supply of Tibana gas, which was crucial for the war effort. It was not your ships or your men or your vaunted fight for freedom that won this. The final battle of the war. It was by the actions of one person, the Jedi Revan, that you prevailed. Revan's strategies and tactics defeated the best of us. Even Mandalore himself was taken aback by the ferocity, the tenacity, and the subtlety of Revan's plans. Candorous Ordo During the years 3961 BBY and 3960 BBY, Revan led the Republic Navy in a series of offensives against the Mandalorians. The Republic liberated Taris, ending its long siege and occupation, with Revan personally leading a group of Jedi into battle in Taris's undercity. There, Revan freed a group of slaves destined for the market, including a Force-sensitive Cathar named Yuhani, who was encouraged by Revan's companion to join the Jedi Order. Despite numerous victories, Revan's strategies increasingly involved sacrificing populations and key planets to secure victories, understanding that the Republic's industrial strength was crucial for success. Under Revan's leadership, moral shortcuts became routine as he and Malak adopted a policy of victory at any cost. Early in 3961 BBY, they discovered an ancient Rakatan ruin on Dantooine, containing a star map, which revealed part of the location of the Rakatan space station known as the Star Forge. Revan soon found another star map on Kashyyyk, and briefly visited the Sith tomb world of Korriban. On Malachor V, Revan discovered the Treus Academy, a Sith temple, and began to be seduced by the dark side of the Force. Despite this, Revan and Malak did not initially renounce their Jedi ways and continued to lead the Republic against the Mandalorians. During this period, Mandalorian and Jedi armies fought on Vur IV for several weeks, with the Mandalorians gradually losing ground. A young recruit named War Mugen defied orders to abandon the planet and instead fortified a position known as Blood Ridge. His men successfully held the ridge for several days, distracting the Jedi while other positions were fortified and counterattacks were mounted. 
The Battle of Blood Ridge became a symbol of courage and determination in Mandalorian culture. With Mugin's battle plan sketched on a piece of leather from his tabard, revered by many clans, Republic forces attacked Mandalorian space from the Perlemian, starting with the Vorsid system. They then split into two offensives, with one army driven back at the Lukasek system, while the other successfully took the Stenos and Elom systems, moving onward to Jaga's cluster. However, the Battle of Jaga's cluster was a disaster for the Republic, despite Revan and Malak's presence. Cassus Fett emerged victorious and gained notoriety for personally boarding a Republic flagship and killing its captain. In the Battle of Altir, Revan's men annihilated most of the Mandalorian ground units, reclaiming the industrial world after 25 years of Mandalorian control. Later in the Mandalorian Wars, Revan ordered an assault on Onderon and its moon Ditsun, a heavily fortified Mandalorian stronghold. The offensive was costly for the Republic, as the Mandalorians had spent decades fortifying the moon with minefields, traps, anti-air turrets and dangerous jungle beasts. Revan's plan involved deploying battle droids to neutralize the anti-air turrets, followed by hundreds of small unit feints to probe the Mandalorian defenses under the command of Jedi General Mitra Surik. Despite losing most of her soldiers to minefields, Surik continued with Revan's strategy. The battle lasted for months, with the Republic suffering incredibly high casualties. Veterans estimated ten Republic soldiers died for every Mandalorian killed. Ultimately, the Republic captured the moon, forcing the Mandalorians to retreat toward the Outer Rim. I remember the ships, the last stand of the Republic, the tattered remnants of our fleet, the largest we could gather, but it was damaged, weakened and vulnerable. The Mandalorians couldn't resist. They tore into us like beasts, shredding our ships to scrap as we fought back. I remember the look you had when you turned to me. It was the longest you'd ever looked at me. You didn't say anything, just a nod. Events move quickly then, even in my dreams, flashes, explosions, you falling. I could feel the pain around me and then the memory. The drifting hulks of the Mandalorian ships, the dead, allies, friends, strangers, and then the echo, lingering, the sound I awaken to in my nightmares. Baudur. In 3960 BBY, Revan continued to push the Mandalorians back, allowing the Republic to reclaim the Liana system. Revan then orchestrated a decisive showdown at Malachor V, amassing a massive fleet to draw the Mandalorians into a final battle. He had a secret weapon. The Mass Shadow Generator, a gravitational device created by the Zabrak engineer Baudur. This superweapon was central to Revan's trap to end the conflict. Revan divided his forces, placing half under Mitra Surik's command to lure the Mandalorians within range of the superweapon, and tasked her with activating the Mass Shadow Generator. However, Revan was delayed by a Mandalorian scouting party outside the Malachor system and arrived to find a fierce battle between Mandalore the Ultimate's fleet and Surik's men. Realizing defeat was imminent due to Republic reinforcements, Mandalore challenged Revan to single combat aboard his flagship. Revan accepted and engaged in a duel with the Mandalorian chieftain. Despite Mandalore's strength, Revan eventually prevailed, striking him down. As Mandalore lay dying, he revealed that the Sith had manipulated him, providing Revan with coordinates to the planet Rekiad as proof. Mandalore then handed over his mask, the symbol of Mandalorian leadership, which Revan took to prevent a new Mandalore from rising. Following Revan's victory over Mandalore, the Republic soldiers pushed the Mandalorian fleet closer to Malachor V, though they suffered heavy casualties. Surik, Realizing the desperate situation ordered Baudur to activate the mass shadow generator. Both Revan's and Surik's ships were out of the weapon's range and they watched, as most of the Mandalorian fleet and a significant portion of the Republic fleet were pulled into a massive gravity vortex. Tens of thousands died as hundreds of ships were drawn to Malachor's surface, devastating the planet and fracturing its core. The Republic's losses were severe, but the Mandalorians were nearly annihilated. The mass deaths created a substantial wound in the Force, and Surik, the closest Jedi to the Vortex, instinctively severed her connection to the Force to survive the shockwave. In the aftermath of the destruction, the remaining Mandalorians transmitted their unconditional surrender to the Republic. In the aftermath of the war, the Jedi Council demanded that the remaining Revanchists, specifically Revan, Malak, and Surik, return to Coruscant 
to face judgment for their actions at the end of the war. Revan and Malak refused, taking the remainder of their troops into the unknown regions, claiming they were pursuing the remaining Mandalorians. Surik, feeling disconnected from the Force, chose to return to the Council. Malak suggested to Revan that they use his new HK-47 assassin droid to eliminate Surik, but Revan declined, saying she was already dead. Revan had created HK-47 to eliminate specific targets, aiming to avoid battles like Malakor. Revan and Malak soon left their forces and traveled alone to Rekiad to verify Mandalora's story. There, they discovered Dramath's tomb and a datacron detailing Dramath's history and the existence of a hidden Sith Empire. Before leaving Rekiad, Revan left Mandalore's mask in Dramath's tomb. Following the hidden Sith trail, Revan and Malak reached the Empire's capital of Dromund Kaas, where they attempted to kill the Sith Emperor to prevent an invasion of the Republic. However, the Emperor dominated their minds and turned them fully to the dark side, making them his servants. They were renamed Darth Revan and Darth Malak, Dark Lords of the Sith, and sent back as the Emperor's advance agents to invade the Republic, tasked with locating the Star Forge. Unbeknownst to the Emperor, Revan and Malak broke free of his control soon after leaving Droman Kaas, and unknowingly adopted the Emperor's commands as their own desires. They found the Star Forge in the Unknown Regions, and used it to produce a massive fleet of warships, combined with their followers from the Mandalorian Wars, forming a new Sith Empire. Admiral Carath was one of several high-ranking Republic officers who joined the new Sith, and in 3959 BBY, Revan led his empire in invading the Republic. This conflict, known as the Jedi Civil War, lasted until 3956 BBY, when a redeemed Revan defeated his former apprentice at the Battle of Rakata Prime. During the war, a group of refugees, including wealthy businessmen, crash-landed their transport on the planet Makeb while fleeing Mandalorian raiders. Makeb, located off major hyperspace routes, saw its survivors, led by business magnate Semiko Thalian, build settlements and re-establish contact with the galaxy over the next 50 years. Using the planet's rich mineral deposits and their resources, they transformed Makeb into a profitable world. Remaining largely independent from the Republic, Makib attracted corporate leaders, banking enterprises, and wealthy tourists, developing numerous luxury resorts. The Interdictor technology, which led to the creation of the Interdictor-class cruiser and the mass shadow generator, was developed by Zabrak engineers during the conflict and became a frequently used tactic in the millennia following the Mandalorian Wars. Interdictor technology, particularly ship-based gravity wells, led to a series of advances and countermeasures over thousands of years. The relatively weak interdictors of the Mandalorian Wars were eventually rendered ineffective by better hyperdrive sensor suites and multi-phase null field units. The Clone Wars, almost 4,000 years later, spurred new research into the technology. Ion blasters also saw increased use during and after the Mandalorian Wars, proving effective in disabling the Mandalorian raiders' weaponry. Thousands of years later, during the era of the Galactic Empire, Scientist Bevel Lemelisk included the Mass Shadow Generator in a list of historical superweapons in the Imperial Handbook, a commander's guide. However, by that time, the exact details of the weapon's effect on Malachor V were unknown, though the planet had long since been destroyed. As a defining conflict of its era, the Mandalorian Wars were frequently referenced in scholarly texts and documents. Jedi Master Nos Dural wrote about it briefly, while chronicling his investigations into the Mandalorians of his time, and historian Vilnau Teupt discussed the conflict during his speech, Industry Honor Savagery, Shaping the Mandalorian Soul, in 24 ABY. In the aftermath of the Battle of Malakor V, known in Mandoa as Anila Akan, or the Great Last Battle, Revan commanded that the remaining Mandalorians be disarmed and their basilisk war droids dismantled. To prevent them from rallying under a new leader, he kept Mandalore's mask, which left the Mandalorians demoralized. Without the mask, the various clans fragmented and often fought among themselves for power, leading many warriors to become mercenaries or bounty hunters. Over the subsequent years, clans like Clan Ordo began searching for the mask, 
identifying potential worlds Revan might have reached during the three days he and Malak disappeared after Malakor. Initially, fewer than 50 Mandalorians participated in the search on the First World, taking two years, but as they moved from planet to planet, their numbers grew as more clans joined. By the time they reached Rekiad in 3954 BBY, over a hundred clans were involved. Revan, who had lost his memories during the Jedi Civil War, sought the help of his friend Candorus Ordo, who had fought alongside him during the war, to investigate his returning memories in 3954 BY. The two traveled to Rekiad and joined the search. With Revan's assistance, Clan Ordo discovered the mask in Dramath's tomb. Revan persuaded Ordo to take up the mask as Mandalore the Preserver. Before departing to retrace his and Malak's steps into the unknown regions, Revan asked the new Mandalore to rebuild the Mandalorian's strength to protect the Republic from the Sith threat. Mandalore the Preserver spent the next few years reuniting the clans and rebuilding their military might, establishing a headquarters on Dick Sun and reviving the Neo-Crusader movement. During the Dark Wars that followed the Jedi Civil War, one of the new Sith Lords, Darth Neolus, a survivor of the Battle of Malakor Fief, rose to power. Transformed by the experience, Neolus became a being who craved Force energy and was a living wound in the Force. He used the Force to pull the Ravager, a Centurion-class battlecruiser destroyed at Malakor V from the planet's surface, and made it his flagship. The Ravager was eventually destroyed by combined Republic and Mandalorian army, with Mandalore the Preserver joining Mitra Surik, now known as the Jedi Exile, in a final assault on the ship, as his forces fought alongside the Republic. Despite the Mandalorian War's failure, Mandalore the Ultimate's reforms had lasting impacts on Mandalorian society. The Tong species became virtually extinct, with the clans becoming human-dominated and accepting any warriors who proved themselves worthy. A ritual known as the Giroya Beharan, or Game of Annihilation, emerged in Mandalorian culture in the centuries following the wars. The loser would have their entire legacy erased, symbolically retelling the Neo-Crusaders' greatest victories during the Mandalorian Wars. Mandalore the Preserver was the last known Mandalore to wear Mandalore's mask, which vanished after his death. Many clans, having grown rich from plundering during the wars, lost their riches afterward, leaving them longing for a return to conflict.